Welcome to the Dr. Lori Morris podcast, where she interviews experts in health and science, sharing their expertise so you can live your healthiest life. This episode of the podcast is proudly sponsored by Fit Vegan Coaching, the world's leading whole food plant-based body recomposition program for Gen X and baby boomers. Founded by Maxime, whose personal journey began after losing his ex fiance to breast cancer, Fit Vegan Coaching is on a mission to disease-proof the world through the transformative power of plant-based eating and fitness. This program is a Rolls Royce of plant-based coaching, offering all-inclusive services, personalized plans, world-class accountability, lifelong support, and more. Say goodbye to the yo-yo dieting and embrace a lasting transformation that will rev up your metabolism even post-transformation. Ready to take charge of your health and vitality? Head over to fitvegan.ca, that's fitvegan.ca, and mention Dr. Lori for exclusive bonus savings when you sign up. Don't miss this opportunity to join the movement towards a healthier, fitter, and more vibrant you. This episode of the podcast is proudly sponsored by The Healing Kitchen, your path to vibrant health. Immerse yourself in the transformative program, guided by the combined expertise of myself, Dr. Lori Marbus, and Chef Brittany Giroudi, who has lost 70 pounds on a whole food plant-based diet. Here's what's in store for you. Virtual weekly sessions. Engage in an immersive 60-minute virtual session every single week, where you'll delve into the world of wholesome plant-based goodness right from your own kitchen. Cooking with Brittany the first half hour. Unleash your inner chef as you're captivated by Chef Brittany Giroudi's culinary mastery that will delight your taste buds and nourish your body. Medical Q&A with Dr. Lori the last half hour. Prioritize your well-being during the second half hour. I will personally address your medical inquiries, providing evidence-based insights and personalized advice, empowering you to make informed choices for your health. So join us on the Healing Kitchen to help you step into a healthier and most vibrant future. Welcome to the podcast. I'm very excited and honored to welcome Brenda Davis, who many of you know, who's plant-powered registered dietitian, has written many books, done some amazing research, and just the practical knowledge is going to be really fun. But today we're going to focus on some really uh, very important topics. But first, let me welcome you. Thank you for joining us today, Brenda. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, well, this will be fantastic. So I'd like to lay the stage for those who are unaware of your history. Can you speak to a little bit about your interest in becoming a registered dietitian and then how you really focus in on a whole food plant-based diet or plant-based diets in particular? Yeah, well, it, it you know, it started probably about, you know, I, I would say almost 50 years ago. So yeah, <laughs> when I was a teenager, uh, I was really interested in nutrition. And I started uh, just reading books, and and some of the books that I acquired somehow were on vegetarian diets, and and for some reason I was always intrigued by this way of living because I I, I thought it would be cool to be able to eat in a way uh, that was more compassionate uh, towards animals, and you know as we as we grow up I think we get desensitized to to those kinds of things and. And so it was always there. And then in university, this is kind of funny. I can still remember the one day we were going to learn about a vegetarian diet. And, and I was really excited. I thought, you know, this is so exciting. I'm going to learn about uh, vegetarian nutrition. And we learned two things that day. And this is probably 1978 or something like that, 1979, somewhere around there. And um, we learned two things. We learned that, that vegetarian diets are risky, especially for children and pregnant and lactating women. And vegan diets are downright dangerous for everyone. And that was it. That was the end of story. And it was felt like a slap in the wrist that I shouldn't even be thinking about these fad diets. And they were in our textbook. They were part of the fad diet section. And, uh, and that was it. And, and so I... You know, I, but for some reason, I just kept being pulled in that direction. I was so interested in human health. I was interested in the environment. I was interested in animals. And so it kept, it was like a magnet that kept pulling me 
um, in that direction. And then uh, probably 1988, 89, I had an interaction with uh, one of our best friends who happened to be on his way deer hunting. And it, this is what changed the course of my life. Uh, it, it really, um, yeah, this is where I decided to jump off, uh, you know, into the water uh, without turning back. And I was a public health nutritionist in Northern Ontario. Never, I met one vegetarian in my entire life. And so this was a very new world for me. And here I am as a public health a nutritionist for the community and you know teaching Canada's food guide and the four food groups the top two of which were you know meat and dairy products of course and um and this friend I decided to make him try to I try to make him feel guilty about going and killing another deer and it was what he said what he responded to me that really changed um changed my life he said you know just because you don't have the guts to pull the trigger does not mean you are not responsible for the trigger being pulled. Every time you buy your piece of meat camouflaged in cellophane in the grocery store, he said, at least the animals I eat have had a life. He said, I don't think you can say the same for the ones that are sitting on your plate. Mm. And, oh, wow. And That's... so, yeah. So, and he still is a very, very close friend. Uh, but we ended up, you know, I ended up just starting to to feel like I needed to take take real responsibility for what I was eating. And the more I researched, the more I became convinced. And coincidentally, it was 1990 that the World Health Organization put out Diet, Nutrition, and the Prevention of Chronic Disease and implicated animal products and processed foods as the two categories of foods most responsible for killing people mm. and, and or encouraged governments to you know, not be swayed, not let their nutritional po nutrition policy be dictated by industry. And, and that was a very powerful document for me. And uh, I just decided, uh, you know, I, to, to, to become completely plant-based. And that was 1989, I would say. And wow. uh, yeah, and I said to my husband, we had two children at the time, four and one, we still do, of course, four and one. Um, at the time, and and so they were still little enough to you know to to be easy enough to 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 change too. And but I asked my husband if he'd be willing to you know go on this journey with me. And he looked at me and he said, "I thought you'd never ask. I would Aww. love. I would love to." He said, "I just have always wanted to leave a softer footprint on the planet, and I can't think of a better way of doing that. So mm. I'm in." I was so lucky. I know, I know how, how fortunate I was because a lot of uh, a lot of partners do not respond in, in that way. Mm. That was my similar experience. My husband was like, are you still cooking? He's like, OK. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's we awesome. Literally went overnight. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. So how did you begin? I mean, what was available as far as resources, education? Did you start? Like, where did you well, learn? You know, there, there really wasn't much. So there was Diet for New America by John Robbins. There were uh, Michael Clapper's two books, um, mm. Vegan Pregnancy and, and uh, Vegan Nutrition, Pure and Simple. And those were two little, you know, fairly small books, but they were, they were beautifully done. Uh, there really wasn't much else. And that's why uh, very soon after I started, I got together with a couple of other vegetarian dietitians, and we decided that we really needed a, a guidebook for people that wanted to do this. And so we wrote Becoming Vegetarian, and, and it was a you know, national bestseller within a few months and picked up by several other countries and translated. And it was really the first, I think the first book by dietitians on how to do a vegan diet uh, safely. We called it becoming vegetarian, but it was actually, we had a chapter called without meat and another <laughs> chapter called without dairy. And the dairy industry thought this would be a, a very dairy friendly book. And uh, they were not impressed when they picked it up. They actually wrote a 45 page rebuttal to our book, made it free of charge to every health professional in the country and took out a full page ad in our professional journal to try to discredit our work. So they were scared, um, and uh, yeah. So they they 
they spent a lot of money trying to 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 put us under <laughs> wow so you were like the oh one of the ogs really showing <laughs> i mean was that a shot to see it was public display of aggression oh, towards you for writing oh, a dietary it, book yeah it was and you know to see this ad in our professional journal trying to you know discredit what we were doing it was so i thought it was so oh. embarrassing and and i always wanted to be respected by my colleagues but but what ended up happening is my colleagues read their rebuttal they read our book and they sided with us mm. mm -hmm. <laughs> um saying that you know what the dairy industry was saying against us was beyond ridiculous they took things out of context they just said you know, really goofy things like if people actually did what the dietitians in this book say we should do, that would mean we would be eating more polyunsaturated fats and less ruminant fat and cancer would just go through the roof. That's what they said. Okay, that's... <laughs> so it was laughable. Okay. It was yeah. laughable. Wow. Well, if anything, maybe that boosted it recognition. Boosted for sure. <laughs> Wow. I, I can't even imagine. It just makes, it's just exhausting to me to think about what, uh, just let be, I mean, if that's what we're supposed to be eating is a whole food plant-based diet, just anyway, I, setting <laughs> politics aside. So how did you approach this with individuals? I mean, did you, you were in the public health sector at that point? Were you, were you still there when you wrote this book or how did you start your no, new career? So, so I was in Northern Ontario and within a, a year of becoming completely plant-based, we moved to Vancouver area uh, where we met other real live vegetarians and vegans <laughs> for the first time. <laughs> Okay, and, uh, and even a vegetarian dietitian, uh, two vegetarian dietitians actually, and and so it was a very different world out west, sort of like California versus Texas, I guess. Mm. And, oh yes. and so yeah, so it was it was uh, much more welcoming, and and that's where we we wrote the book. And you know, when we conceived of it, we sent a one page sort of outline to two publishers, and they fought over us. They both mm -hmm. wanted. Yeah, it was not hard to get a book published. So, wow, that's yeah. fantastic. The timing was good. <laughs> yes. Well, obviously, I don't believe in coincidence. I think it's serendipity is like things happen for a reason at the time. <laughs> they and do. The Absolutely. people, you just have to be open to the opportunity and, and take it and take action. So that's fantastic. So as you moved into the Vancouver area, so what was your next step? So was, I know you've done a lot of different things. Can you highlight some of the the bigger things that you've researched or books? Yeah, and then we'll so, hone in on, I think, the last book. I think it's an important thing that we need to speak about. Yeah. And so so once I got to Vancouver, I, I started uh, teaching at a college and I, I did, um, you know, working at a lipid clinic and just little little jobs. My my kids were still very young. I had my son still at home, and so I I went into private practice, if you will, and doing you know contract work. Um, but uh, I I went on to write uh, becoming vegan, and you know a couple of, of raw food books, and and then a diabetes book in 2003 called Defeating Diabetes, and that book is what brought me to the Marshall Islands, and I I was involved in a a clinical trial there where I, you know, sort of designed the, the program and implemented the program in, in the Marshall Islands uh, using a, you know, we had a control group and an intervention group where we used a whole food plant-based diet and exercise and, and other uh, pillars of lifestyle medicine, if you will. And, uh, and we had five overlapping cohorts and it was, it was really a wonderful, uh, very, very challenging experience, but wonderful experience. So just to give you an example, we were given the TB and leprosy clinic uh, to transform into a diabetes wellness center. And, and the medical uh, stainless steel cabinets probably had two inches of rat droppings in them uh, everywhere. Um, the bathrooms, I don't think had been cleaned for two years. There, were, there wasn't even toilet seats on them. Uh, it was uh, really, uh, overrun with cockroaches and rats and and so oh, it was heaven. a tough it was a tough job and I was there with 
you know, I think we had eight or nine men and I had to do all the cooking for everybody on a two burner cooktop stove while I was designing the program, creating, um, you know, the, the, all of the PowerPoint presentations and the recipes and training staff and all of that. It was, it was really a lot of work. Wow. How long did these studies run? Well, we were, I was there the first time for eight months and then I, wow. came, I went back and forth probably eight or 10 more times. Oh my goodness. So what was the outcome and where does that stand now? Is it? Well, actually our results paper is just about to be published. Um, and, and this is a long lag between when it actually happened and when it was published, but we we published the um, a paper in 2019, sort of out, outlining the the program and all of you know the details of the program, and and this year the the results will be will be published. It was tough because uh, we didn't have um, uh, you know the lab at the hospital uh, had difficulty getting our blood samples to Hawaii on you know in in reasonable time, and so mm. we lost a lot of our blood work. And so it was, it, it, it uh, presented a lot of challenges, but finally we decided, you know, I, I felt like it doesn't matter if our results were compromised. It doesn't matter. Uh, we need to share what we learned in doing this so that mm. other people could, could uh, benefit from that. And so that's, that's where we're at. So it should, should be out soon. <laughs> wow. Which uh, journal? Uh, well, we submitted it to Diabetes Care. So we'll okay. see what happens. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, we don't, people don't think about the research and <laughs> the actual requirements to actually run particular studies. We just read the summary over, you know, five, six, exactly. seven pages and we're like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Meanwhile, <laughs> you know, there's months and years and grants oh. and IRBs yeah. and like, <laughs> that's right. oh, yeah. even just the editing process. Problem. Submitting, oi, oi. yes, um, <laughs> appreciate that. So, okay, so now we've you've written Becoming Vegetarian, Becoming Vegan, you have the diabetes books, but the most, well, and the Nourish was the plant-based book for families. Can we highlight what's in there? Because I definitely know people will yeah, be interested. Yeah, so, so after that first diabetes book, I, I did another two diabetes books, a sort of a guidebook and a cookbook. Okay. And then uh, came Nourish. And Nourish I did with Dr. Reshma Shaw from San Francisco. She's a pediatrician. Uh, and uh, we, it really is a, a book for families. And it's, it's all about how to raise healthy plant-based children. And, uh, and it's, yeah, I think it's a beautiful book. Uh, mm. and, and actually, I'll just show you what it looks like. It's, that's Nourish. And uh, anyway, we... Uh, we, we uh, um, uh, worked really well together and, and I think it's been, it's been a, a really valuable addition to the plant-based world because we didn't have anything like that before. Uh, and then I, I co-authored uh, Plant Powered Protein with my um, usual writing partner, Vasanta Molina, who was also the senior author for the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics position statement on plant-based or vegetarian diet. And my son, Corey, he did the environmental section. And so that was really a, a wonderful project. And Vicento and I have a third book or another book coming out soon. I guess it will be more like our ninth book together or something <laughs> like that. And it's going to be, uh, we're just starting it, but it's going to be uh, for plant-based seniors or people mm -hmm. that are wanting to, seniors that are wanting to move in the plant-based direction or older adults, I'm not sure. What term is wiser? Right. Wiser. Yeah. <laughs> so if anything comes with more time spent on Earth, it's wisdom. Hopefully. Absolutely. <laughs> I well, I, that. I'm really excited about that because most of my patients are middle aged or older, so I think that's really quite phenomenal and be a fantastic resource. So can't wait to see see it come out. Mm -hmm. um, but can we right. kind of circle back around to plant based protein, the plant powered protein? Because I think that's one piece that's a constant conversation, at least in the United States culture, is about where do you get your protein? <laughs> Absolutely. And can we just start with some of the basic myths that we've heard and what is the actual facts around protein sources and how much you actually need? Yeah, well, I think the biggest myth is, is that you need meat uh, to get enough protein. And, and um, 
you know, the, the reality, of course, is you don't need meat to get protein. Uh, in fact, you know, the essential amino acids are, are largely produced by plants. And so it doesn't make sense to think we can't get them from plants. It's, it's where they come from. Um, but, it, you know, protein-rich plant foods provide a, a more healthful, more ecologically sustainable, and a kinder way of providing protein to a very rapidly growing human population. And to me, it just doesn't make sense to source protein from animals when it's not only unnecessary, but it, it, we've, we've realized that it, it can hurt humans. It's, it's one of the biggest contributors to climate change and environmental degradation. It causes a just unthinkable suffering for billions of animals. People have no idea how many animals we're slaughtering every year. I think it's 70 or 80 billion animals. And that doesn't include anything from the ocean or the seas. Uh, that's just land animals every year. And, uh, and so, you know, the reality is people need about 10 to 15 percent of calories from protein. And there are actually very few plant foods that don't provide that much. <laughs> so, you know, uh, legumes and non-starchy vegetables uh, provide in the range of generally about 20 to 40 percent of calories from protein. Uh, most nuts, seeds, grains are in the neighborhood of 10 to 20 percent. Um, you know, the only category of food in the plant-based world that is below that 10%, um, you know, starchy vegetables are close around 8 to 12%, but fruits are generally 1 to 10% of calories from protein. But if you're consuming a variety of plant foods and you're getting enough calories, generally you will also get enough uh, protein. Now, there are some caveats there, you know, there um, uh, for very young children, uh, often they'll eat very starchy diets and, and they need to get the legumes in there. But probably the biggest um, issue, athletes, it's not usually an issue because they eat so many calories. So they can generally meet their targets um, uh, fairly easily. But for seniors, it can be a, a, a more of a challenge because seniors tend to eat less. And so they're eating fewer calories. They digest uh, protein less efficiently. They build muscle less efficiently. And so they, you know, there are a lot of countries now that are saying we need a separate recommendation or RDA or whatever in their country for, uh, for older adults uh, for these reasons. And sarcopenia and, you know, uh, frailty and so forth may be increased by, you know, inadequate protein intake. Uh, so I think for plant-based eaters, uh, because we tend to, the digestibility of plant plant protein is a little lower. Uh, it makes sense to be looking at slightly higher intakes for plant-based seniors, which means because they eat less food, a little bit of a greater focus on the legume group and, and the nuts and seeds and so forth. No, that makes complete sense because I have absolutely seen this play out. And sometimes I'll see patients who are really focused in on a particular guru's recommendations of eating a pound of this or this or that. And really, it takes up their appetite and they're not focusing in on those really important foods like the legumes where they can get their protein sources. I've absolutely seen that. It's um, not uncommon it for sure. It is not uncommon at all. And, and, you know, the other thing I think is worth mentioning is that, is that we now have a number of studies showing that, that there's actually an advantage to getting your protein from plants over animals and, and in terms of disease uh, risk reduction. Uh, and, and probably one of the, you know, the biggest over, I think over 400,000 individuals in this uh, uh, NIH study, uh, this is in the United States, they actually reported a 10% drop in more overall mortality when just 3% of calories from protein, from animal protein, were replaced with 3% of calories from plant protein. And to put that in context, we're talking about 60 calories in a 2,000 calorie diet. That's less than one large egg. That's about an ounce of meat. So the, it, replacing that tiny amount can reduce uh, mortality about 10% on average. And, and so if, if we brought that up to 9%, 12%, think of what that would mean. And, and you know, if we, if we did the math, they actually quantified the impact of various animal protein sources like, like red meat and eggs and, you know, um, uh, milk and, and fish and so forth. 
And if we if we did the math based on their their findings, if we we um, you know replaced uh, say you get two ounces of meat, a cup of milk, and an egg uh, with uh, plant protein, we would be reducing mortality about fifty four percent based on that particular study. So it's wow. you know, and we and we see this consistently with diabetes research, cardiovascular disease research, type 2 diabetes uh, research, that replacing animal protein with plant protein consistently reduces risk and significantly reduces risk. There was actually a study from Japan that reported um, a 50% drop in cancer mortality when 3% of calories from processed meat were replaced with plant protein. I think it was close to 40% when it was red meat. So just unbelievable numbers. So this this matters. This you know we always you know when when we talk about protein, we talk about protein quality. The the you know the usual song and dance is that you know animal products have higher quality protein because uh, the the essential amino acid profile is 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 really uh, complete. Where they have all the essential amino acids in all the right proportions, and then. You know, it's uh, it's perfectly digestible, so it's it, you know they call it high quality, and they think of plant protein as low quality because there may be one amino acid that's in you know sh a shorter supply than what we need per gram of protein, um, uh, and, and so so you know they don't think that when we're eating a variety of foods we store these amino acids and draw on them, and it, this really isn't a big issue. Digestibility might be you know, five to 10% lower in, in plants. But in fact, that's probably an advantage, not a disadvantage in certain uh, respects. And, and so, you know, what they fail, that what we have failed to do as scientists is, is you know, somehow in that definition to include uh, the, the health consequences of these various protein sources and the environmental consequences of our, our uh, protein choices. And and to me, uh, uh, you know, protein quality is is also about these things, and I think it it really would be time to redefine uh, protein quality uh, for today's world. Mm. So stepping outside of digestibility, absorption, or the perceived yeah. absorption, but looking at the consequences of particular protein intake, source intake. So just kind of segueing into, can we highlight what is it about animal protein that makes it so unhealthy? Oh, there, there, you know, there's a lot, there's a laundry list of things that, that uh, can, can make it so unhealthy. And it starts with, um, you know, it's one of our biggest sources of, of the harmful or inflammatory fats, such as, um, you know, saturated fat. Uh, it's a source of trans fatty acids. Uh, animal um, protein foods are, you know, they, they're they high on the food chain, so they're more concentrated sources of environmental contaminants. Uh, when we cook them, uh, we produce heterocyclic amines and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and advanced glycation end products and, 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 and these kinds of, you know, very inflammatory uh, compounds. Uh, they are, you know, sources of endotoxins. They're sources of... Uh, of the precursors of TMAO and 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 of course fish is a direct source of TMA. Uh, so there, you know, there the red meat is high in new 5 GC, which is a very pro-inflammatory molecule. Uh, so that there are all kinds of reasons why uh, these uh, foods are, you know, less advantageous when it comes to chronic disease uh, risk. No, so I easily like, just take your pick. Any of those sounds uh, scary enough to be an issue. And where can people learn more? So do you highlight all these different things in your in the new book? Uh, absolutely. So it's pretty comprehensive. It's not a, a huge, thick book, but it's pretty comprehensive. And we go through all the stages of the life cycle. So what do infants and children and, you know, uh, seniors and, and athletes uh, need to do to ensure adequate protein and, and we go through, you know, the, uh, chronic diseases and, you know, we look at all the practical aspects of, of ensuring uh, ample protein in a plant-based diet. Um, and uh, we even look at some of the political, you know, issues and arguments hmm. and some of the historical aspects and, 
you know, the uh, food subsidies for animal products and, and uh, how this is something that definitely needs to change. So it's a... Uh, you be very be careful. The Cattlemen yeah. Associations will be taking on another front page yeah, ad. Yeah, they, <laughs> they, they might not be very happy with us with this book. <laughs> So can we kind of get a little bit more specific to the amount of protein at different ages? Um, because I think that's a big question, like grams per kilo of body weight. Uh, people will ask that if I don't in particular. I think we could start there and have a few follow-up questions probably after that. Yeah, so, so for infants, you're looking at about 1.52 when they're just newborn to six months, and then it goes down to 1.2 until they're one. And then for toddlers, it's 1.05 grams per kilogram body weight. And of course, a kilogram is 2.2 pounds. And then after that, for children, it's about a gram, 0.95 to be precise, but it's about a gram from four to 13 years of age. And then for adolescents, it's 0.85. And for adults, it's 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. Now, it does increase uh, to 1.1 during pregnancy, 1.3 during lactation. And, and so there, you know, there's increased uh, uh, recommendations there. And now many countries are suggesting one to 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight for seniors. We don't have um, any separate uh, uh, RDA for seniors in North America, uh, but, but many experts are now suggesting uh, that amount of protein for, for older adults. So um, as far as protein supplementation, protein powders, is there ever a place for those in a whole food plant-based diet? There can be. I, you know, in my view, um, they're very rarely needed, but I wouldn't say they're never needed. Um, so for example, uh, there are, you know, there are some athletes that, um, you know, just for convenience, uh, like to have a protein boost uh, when they have a smoothie, for example, and, and they'll use hemp protein or a combination of plant proteins in, in that beverage. Uh, for some seniors, uh, it, it can be helpful too. So getting their, you know, their leucine levels up uh, just makes it, it's really a matter of convenience because it is absolutely possible to get enough from plant foods, especially if you're consuming some, and this is a this is a, a very important point for children and for older adults and even for athletes. It can make a big difference if you consume lower fiber, protein rich plant foods. And so what we're talking, because it, it, they have very high digestibility, very similar to animal products in terms of digestibility. So what we're talking about is tofu would be a good example. Uh, veggie meat would be a good example. Uh, um, nut and seed butters would be good examples as well. Uh, so, and soy milk, uh, uh, these, these foods provide very highly digestible uh, protein and, and can make it easier for more vulnerable groups uh, to meet their requirements. Mm, that's perfect. And so depending on the situation, and that's where I feel like you know, the guidance of someone like yourself or a physician who's aware of the nuances of a whole food plant-based diet, it's such an important piece. So when they're calculating um, their doses, so let's say someone needs to lose significant amount of weight. So I absolutely have those patients and they're looking at, you know, obviously there's going to be some changing to whole food plant-based diets already, some calories decrease, but maybe we want to make sure that they're focusing in on the right number of calories. So sometimes I see people go way too far with the other, just get them a general idea. When we're calculating that, how do we base that on, do we look at the ideal body weight or do we base it on their current weight? Like how do you calculate what those protein yeah, so, needs are in so, someone who's obese? You know, that, that is a, such an important question because if you have someone who's 250 or 300 pounds uh, and you're, you're sort of, you know, rounding out and saying, oh, you need about a gram of protein per kilogram body weight, especially when you're losing weight, you don't want to lose too much muscle mass. Uh, that, that would mean they would need 250 or, you know, uh, um, well, per kilogram, plus. they'd need 100, 150 yeah. grams of protein, right? Yeah. And, and that's, you know, that's just not the way it is. So, so the RDA is set for, um, you know, ideal body weight, basically. 
and, or how, what they call healthy body weight. Uh, mm. So it is, you know, you're, you're, so if you weigh 250 pounds, but your healthy body weight is 150 pounds, mm. you will calculate your requirements based on the 150 pounds. And even during pregnancy you, and lactation, you base your requirements on your pre-pregnancy weight as well. Mm. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Now I was going to get to, you know, main, maintenance of muscle mass and yeah. in this process of losing weight. Um, it's, it, I do find that something that people struggle with a little bit. Um, as far as other things, you know, outside of you new know, protein, which we've, I think highlighted and have a really good understanding and definitely need to get your book. Um, what other things that do we need to be mindful of on a whole food plant-based diet? Is there any particular um, nutrients or lack thereof, especially if someone is very restrictive in their approach to a plant-based diet? Yes, and I, I, I really, you know, there's a lot, it, it, there, there's a huge SOS community in the plant-based world, which is no added salt, no added sugar, no added oil. And, and to me, you know, for me, going plant-based is really about, um, helping this world to be a more uh, compassionate, environmentally uh, sustainable place. We want to ensure uh, optimal health for people, but we don't want to make it so difficult that people don't want to do it. Mm. Uh, and, and we still have to live amongst our, our friends and family, and, and we want food to be delicious and appealing. And, and so I don't take quite a as hard, uh, you know, a very hard line approach uh, about those things. And my, in my own diet, I don't tend to use a, a lot of those, but I don't, I, I look at them as, as um, culinary enhancers. And, and so you may find that, you know, a, a spicy peanut sauce, it tastes a little better with a few drops of, of, um, of sesame oil. Uh, and and so I think that that is absolutely fine to use. Uh, uh -huh. So, but 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 I think we need to recognize if we're eating uh, a whole food plant based diet, uh, there's no question that that it will reduce risk of overweight and obesity, of heart disease, of diabetes, of of cancer, of cataracts, of you know um, you know a laundry list of of diseases, hypertension. But there are a couple of things that we do need to be uh, aware of. One is that it, it, we may have an increased risk of um, fractures and osteoporosis uh, because leaner people tend to have a higher risk. We have less bone density. And so we wanna be really um, committed to getting enough calcium and vitamin D and all of the bone building nutrients. There's a long list of them. But th that means just eating a, a reasonable variety of foods. It's not a bad thing necessarily to be having some fortified foods. It's not easy to meet the RDA for calcium for a nine or 10 year old at 1300 milligrams a day, eating only whole plant foods and not including some fortified non-dairy milks. Uh, it may be, be uh, relatively easy to reach five or 600 milligrams, but not very easy to reach 1300. So if you're aiming to meet the RDA, which is not a bad idea, um, it, including some of these fortified foods can be really helpful. Uh, and, and, and there are, you know, uh, higher risks now. And this, I think, is really important for people to recognize that with omnivorous diets, there's a greater risk for deficiency of you know, vitamin C and potassium and, and, and folate. And, you know, there's certain nutrients they tend to be vitamin E lowering. And the same goes with a plant-based diet. There are certain nutrients that, that we are at higher risk for deficiencies of. And that includes vitamin B12. Um, plant foods are not reliable sources of B12. Uh, so reliable sources are supplements and fortified foods. Uh, and, and of course, for people that are plant predominant or who are lacto ovo vegetarian, they can also rely on, on, you know, some of the animal products they might include, unless they're over 50. The government says if you're over 50, do not rely on animal products for B12, because B12 is bound to protein in animal products, and you need enough, you know, you need enough um, uh, stomach acid and enzymes, they'll cleave the B12 
off of the propane it's bound to and a lot of people over 50 uh, that, you know just aren't doing it very efficiently so that's just a, to take note of and but, but um, so b12 basically uh, you know adults may, may have enough stores to last them six to months to two years or something like that um, babies newborn babies born to b12 deficient mothers don't um, they will have irreversible brain damage in, in fairly short order if they're not provided uh, B12. And so as vegetarians or vegans, we really need to know that. We need to make sure. Uh, we did, this is not a nutrient you mess with. You make sure you've got a source of B12 in your diet. Um, and, and then other nutrients that, that are important to consider are vitamin D, but that's not just for plant-based eaters. That's for everyone. Uh, the, the bulk of the people in the world, I think, are probably not getting enough vitamin D. Even if they, you know, are relatively exposed to sunshine, it seems not to be enough. A lot of people have, have low levels. Uh, but vegans, especially, or plant-exclusive eaters, have fewer food sources. So, you know, big sources like fish and eggs uh, that are, of course, excluded, in, and, and, and dairy products, which, you know, we use... I, we, we, uh, we uh, uh, fortify uh, dairy products with vitamin D. But where do we get it in plant foods? Well, you know, vitamin D fortified non-dairy milk is a, is a perfect example, but rarely do people get, you know, uh, 600, uh, you know, uh, IUs from, from fortified foods. So most of us need a supplement. Uh, and then iodine can be an issue. So a lot of plant-based eaters uh, they tend to, you know, want au naturel, and so they don't want iodized salts. They want fancy sea salts or whatever, which are not good iodine sources. Unless, if you're vegan, unless you're eating seaweed on a regular basis, seaweed is a hyper-concentrated uh, source of, of iodine. If you're not eating seaweed, then you're probably, um, you know, not getting enough iodine if you're not using iodine. So mm -hmm. that's another thing that you would need to consider supplementing or, you know, a tiny bit of kelp powder or something like that. But, but again, you know, iodine is interesting because for children, you know, the, the uh, RDA, maybe 120 micrograms and the upper limit, maybe 300. So it's, it's, it's a, you need to be very careful because kelp powder, a 16th of a teaspoon is 150 micrograms on average. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, an eighth of a teaspoon, you could be at the upper limit for a small child. So, mm. so you need to be really cautious. Now, nori sheets or those little nori snack packs, uh, those uh, don't, are not hyper-concentrated. They're, they're, you know, moderately uh, good sources of iodine. So they, they're quite a safe way of getting iodine as well. Uh, and, then, and then the other nutrients that pop up as, as potential issues are, you know, iron and zinc. Um, omega-3 fatty acids. So iron, that vegans consume more iron than omnivores, but we absorb less. Uh, the, the bioavailability of iron in plant foods is a little lower. Now we can eat it, you know, when we eat iron-rich foods like legumes, we can eat them with, you know, vitamin C-rich foods. Uh, we can eat them with, you know, garlic and onions and carotenoid-rich foods to help enhance that absorption. So those are things we can do. Uh, and then zinc is one that is really important for immune function and for, for optimal growth of children. So it, a lack of zinc can cause, a, you know, a stunting of children if it's fairly severe. And, and zinc, the most concentrated sources, again, are legumes, nuts, and seeds. So legumes, nuts, and seeds, iron, zinc, protein, uh, very, very important foods in a plant-based diet. And, and then finally, omega-3 fatty acids. Well, we get plenty if we're eating chia seeds and flax seeds and hemp seeds and walnut of alpha linolenic acid. But our but the more biologically active form of omega threes is is uh, EPA or eicosapentaenoic acid and DHA or docosahexaenoic acid. And those fatty acids are much bigger, longer, more biologically active. As I mentioned, they're very important. They're important for brain function. They're important for your eyes. They're important for your cell membranes, uh, for, for all of the eicosanoids and resolvins and protectins that your body produces. So these are really important nutrients. And we do convert the plant form to these long chain omega-3s, but the conversion is, um, 
you know, it, it is not that efficient and it gets less efficient if we have hypertension or diabetes or if we're aging, uh, the conversion can, can be low. And so my recommendation would be to include an EPA DHA supplement and people think of EPA and DHA as being the fish fat and we need to eat fish to get them. But in fact, fish get their EPA and DHA from microalgae in the ocean. And so, you know, we can actually culture and, and grow this DHA and EPA rich microalgae and not have to rape the oceans to get it. We're just growing it. And, and, and it's, it's fairly available and fairly affordable. So this is, a, to me, a very reasonable supplement to choose. Yes. Yeah, so I agree 150% with everything you're saying. So, yeah, absolutely see what I supplement myself and recommend patients, obviously B12 is non-negotiable. Like I want to make sure. And what I found with patients is when I'm testing their blood levels over, you know, 20 years of being a physician, whether these are omnivorous people or plant-based people is if I can get them above 500, you know, 500 to 1100, they're non-symptomatic. But even in that lower range of normal, I will see people symptomatic of B12 deficiency. It's, it's quite remarkable. Um, so that's one piece. And then iodine. So I've had, I attract all sorts of plant-based folks because it makes sense. I'm licensed everywhere, but they come in, been SOS free for a significant amount of time, get diagnosed with hypothyroidism. And they're like, what's mm -hmm. going on? I'm eating this plant-based diet. I'm like, who oh, are you getting a source of iodine? And they're like, no, we checked the iodine, 24-hour urine collection. Sure enough, we replaced it either with, you know, iodine salt or a supplement clears right up. And yeah. And, but I take vitamin D as well. Like I lived in Florida would run. I love to run out in the sun. I'm light skinned. So melanin's not so much a factor. I still was low. Yes. <laughs> and, oh and my it's goodness. Crazy. There was a study from Hawaii looking at people that were getting 11 hours of full body sun per week. Wow. And they were still low. Uh, yeah. So it it really is a nutrient that most people are not getting enough of. And it's yeah. so important for bone health, but it's important for many other things as well. Yeah. yeah. So I think we, we just need to look at, you know, I, t I myself take, you know, a thousand I use a day, um, in, you know, especially in the wintertime, my husband takes two and my writing partner, who's, who's 82 now, I think she, hmm. She's taking about four to yeah. keep her levels at a healthy range. So yeah. it can vary as you get older, you may need more. I take 2000 I use daily of vitamin D and my levels are, will hit upper thirties, low forties, which is a nice, you know, place. Cause you don't want to be too high. So of course you no. don't take too much. It's amazing. I will see patients come in and someone has put them on like 10,000 I use a day. And I'm Ooh. like, well, we're going to stop that. Um, so it's really fascinating. Um, I did a whole workshop on plant-based labs and discussion of, you know, what we should be checking for and why and gave them an ebook and explaining um, like homocysteine, methylonic acid, looking at the B12, why we need to do these things. But yeah, and then I take the algae omegas threes as well, because, you know, I think of it as an insurance policy for brain health, heart health, so many factors involved here until we get more evidence that indeed we need a certain amount. But I have so many people who are nut phobic. Huh. It, they're they're not phobic and also there's a uh, there's this um you know a, a group of people within this movement that um believe that epa and dha are not only not necessary but are dangerous that increase uh, they increase your risk of prostate cancer and this is just simply not true uh, -uh. uh it, it, i mean some of the studies on this are you know showing um uh, just super you know with super super high intakes and such Mm -hmm. But on a plant-based diet and plant-based supplements, they're very, it, it, it's just getting us by taking a supplement of, you know, three to 500 small milligrams amount. a day or so. Yeah, small amount. It just will get us into the zone that's safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it makes me sad to see people fearing taking this kind of supplement because mm -hmm. uh, it, I think it, it really can be quite protective long, for long-term health. And we, you know, we're on trial in the eyes of the world as plant-based eaters. Yeah. And we need yeah. to show that, that this diet can support health uh, th right. even well into our, our senior years. I mean, we do right. have some good evidence from the Adventist Health Study too. And, 
course, you know, Loma Linda being one of the blue zones and so forth. But we want to really maximize our chances of, of mm. keeping our brains functioning well. Well, you know, I think it's really important to highlight a few things. And it, and it kind of, it's outside of the practicalities of what you should be supplementing or eating. But just this innate concern about, like, they've made a wrong choice if someone's recommending that they take some type of supplement. Like, they feel like it should be the be-all, end-all, perfect solution and I, it's really hard to get over this belief and this fear or shame. Or for example, if I do have someone eating a whole food plant-based diet and something occurs, like they become anxious or they have difficulty with insomnia. I mean, it's a recurring theme. Like I should, I'm doing everything right. Why is something going wrong? You're a human. There's lots of things that could go on here. It's a complex thing going on here. So it's really sad to think that so many people are like, well, we need a plant-based diet. We don't need to be doing that. We don't need to worry about this and that. I was like, actually, we just need to be, you know, understanding that we need to be very conscious of any type of diet we're consuming. There are going to be things that we need to be conscious of and make sure we're eating a wide variety of these foods. But also, you know, it's a nuanced thing. Some people are taking medications that decrease absorption. There's genetics, you know, issues. There's, you know, age. There's all sorts of things occurring absolutely. and there should be no shame in no absolutely and if you come from a from a culture where fish was a a, a real staple in the diet yeah you, you just may naturally not produce as many of the desaturated enzymes that convert plant omega-3s into long chain omega-3s and also if you've been eating an omnivorous diet for for 40 years and then all of a sudden become plant-based certain certain processes can become down regulated because you you know, you're not needing to do conversions that you would need to do as a plant-based eater. And I, I think, I, I love what you said, because I think that people need to recognize that that um, it doesn't matter what dietary pattern you're consuming, all diets need to be appropriately planned. And and if you're eating an omnivorous diet, uh, your, your focus needs to be on reducing chronic disease at risk. And 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 getting you know the saturated fat lower and and you know eating less of the foods that may potentially increase your risk of diabetes and heart disease and so forth. If you're eating a and 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 I should say as well that you know it's been many many years that we have been adding nutrients to foods for omnivores. So we mm. add vitamin D to milk. We add folic acid to flour. We add iron to flour. We add uh, iodine to salt. We've, we've figured out from a public health perspective how to reduce the risk of nutritional deficiencies in the general population. And so with plant-based eaters, it's no different. There are going to be, we have a way lower risk of chronic diseases, but there may be a higher risk for a lack of certain nutrients. And so mm -hmm. in my opinion, we should be you know, fortifying foods for plant-based eaters to ensure that we minimize that risk, but we should also be educating people so that they know how to design a diet to minimize the risk and where uh, supplements are really needed. Uh, it's just not, you know, you're shooting yourself in the foot if you think that, oh, I'm just gonna do it all natural, I'm not gonna worry about B12. Because mm. when, you, when you don't think about B12, your homocysteine shoots up, you, your risk of heart disease shoots up, your mm -hmm. risk of you know, birth defects in your offspring shoot, shoots up. It's mm -hmm. just not worth the risk. What we need to do is to prove this diet can work for everyone and work mm -hmm. really well. Mm -hmm. And so if we see a you know, potential pitfall, we're the ones that need to figure Highlight out. Highlight it. Right, and fix yeah, it. That's it's, fix it. it. Just is, get it resolved. Do it. <laughs> yeah, this makes perfectly common sense. But yes, it's when people get such a restrictive thought, you know, because don't get me wrong, I love all the gurus and the OGs of the plant based space, but they have their particular tenets on what they consider absolutely the rule of thumb when it comes to whole food plant based diet. I take a, like you, I take a much more broader approach, like every category of food has its important piece. And then certain supplementation, like I said, for B12 across the board, vitamin D for those who are deficient, test, don't guess. And omegas as an insurance policy, especially 
for babies, pregnant women, and as we get older, again, across the board. But it's just, it's, a, it's so frustrating when, for example, I have comments on my YouTube. I can't wait to see the comments on this. But anyway, I can't see these comments on my YouTube page. And one of them was, I can't remember now who I had interviewed, but they were like, well, I'm sure Dr. Marbus uh, tells patients to avoid nuts because of you know, the potential heart risk. So I went out of my way and listed 10 reasons why nuts were actually heart healthy. And it's, it, 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 it boggles my mind. <laughs> why people are like, will judge you as a physician, or if you're interviewing someone and they're saying, go eat nuts. And they're like, nope, you can't because of heart disease risk. And I'm like, there's no, no evidence that I'm aware of that nuts are going to be harmful to your cardiovascular. If anything, it's just the opposite. But if you have evidence or any thoughts on such a thing, I would love yeah. to hear that. Well, well, uh, you know, if you just go to PubMed, do a search <laughs> on nuts and health, nuts right. and cardiovascular disease, nuts and diabetes, you will pretty much 100% of the time find that they're protective. And, right. and they are one of, as a matter of fact, in the Adventist Health Study, they came out as being the most protective food. <laughs> they, yes. were, they were more protective than anything. Uh, and, and it's because nuts contain, you know, when you eat a whole food plant-based diet, uh, the level of fat is pretty low. And nuts are our source of very high quality protected fats. They're naturally protected in the whole food. And, and they are loaded with, tra you know, these foods are loaded with trace minerals yes. and certain things yes. that you don't get as much of from other yes. foods. And you know selenium and Brazil nuts, and and each nut provides something a little bit different, yes. and they are really uh, important to me. Not yes. just because they're so nutritious, but also because you need a certain amount of fat to maximize your absorption of fat soluble nutrients. There are many like vitamin D and vitamin E and so forth that are fat soluble, and you need some fat to maximize absorption. Yes. And also fat is so critical to the body's functioning, to the brain, to your, you know, your cell membranes, to, you know, just for protection of the body, for the production of all of these chemicals that control various body systems, for the production of hormones. Mm -hmm. There's so many things that fat is important for. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be eating excessive fat. You don't want to be especially eating excessive harmful fats like saturated mm -hmm. fat and trans fatty acids. You don't want to be eating excessive oxidized fats, fats that have been cooked at very high temperatures or have gone rancid, but fats as part of an avocado or a nut or a seed are really healthy foods. And the mm. reason why they've got this little black mark in the plant-based community is because of the early work on reversing heart disease by mm -hmm. Dr. Dean Ornish and by Dr. Caldwell Essexton. Right. And their studies, they wanted to get fat so low that they could actually reverse the plaque and blood vessels in very, very sick uh, patients with severe coronary artery disease. And so they excluded high fat plant foods. Now they got wonderful results and we give them all the credit for that, but they never did the study comparing that diet mm -hmm. with the very same diet that included an ounce of nuts or seeds. Yes. And, and I'm not sure what would happen if they did. It may be that the people with the small amount of nuts or seeds do even better. We I don't know. The question uh, is still up in the air. Thank you. This is like the, <laughs> duh, if I could hug you virtually, I would right now. <laughs> this is absolutely so true. And it's so nice to <laughs> hear this discussion because Oh, I, I have had patients who have been very ill with cardiac disease. Now I can't compare and say it's a, a study and, you know, it's was published or anything, but for my own personal anecdotal case reports and that I have with patients, I've done very well with addition of, you know, half a cup, a quarter cup to a half a cup of a variety of nuts and seeds, specifically encouraging walnuts, chia, flax, you know, pumpkin seeds, you know, whatever they flavor, but you know, these are wonderful foods. My own experience, just my end of one, when I first went on a whole food plant-based diet 12 years ago, I went really all in very strict, low fat cut out, you know, one, I 
literally overnight. We'd eat pretty healthy before, but this literally just cut everything out. I didn't really cook with oil before or anything like that. So I went from, you know, I wouldn't say a, I'd say a healthier American style diet to strictly SOS plant based. I was eating fruits, you know, veggies, beans, whole grains. But I got uh, over a period of time got really kind of down. Like my mood was down. I was like, what is going on? And as I started doing more research, like, I think I need some more fat in my diet. And so I went, because I was always thinner already, I added nuts and seeds back in and my mood improved dramatically. And so I I'm really that's where I really became new, you know, conscious of the the what people were eating. Plus I had some other patients, you know, how they when I said first go plant-based, they just did fruits and veggies and they didn't include, you know, legumes and, you know, the starchy veggies and other things like that, that would support them with enough calories and whole grains to feel, you know, not only satiated, but have energy to sustain them. And they would come back fatigued. And I was like, okay, Lori, you have to be very specific in your recommendations. So I, it's really interesting though, but there will be people who will, they will, they will shun people in a whole food plant-based community if they're eating nuts or seeds or they say it's okay to consume a little bit of oil. Like I'm sure I'm going to probably get some hate mail on this, but I don't use oil. I don't use oil to cook. It's not in my home, but if you are healthy and you want to use olive oil or like you said, a little sesame oil and a little peanut sauce, that's okay. And you're yeah, it's, and, it's okay. <laughs> and I think we need to also be conscious of um you know just our our cultural heritage as well yeah. and in some cultures you know olive oil is such um an important staple yeah. and and people that have grown up with it it's really hard for them to completely give it up mm -hmm. and i'm not sure they really need to uh, mm -mm. and and so they're you know again if you look at the blue zones it's so interesting because in Okinawa, it was a very low fat, around 10% of calories from fat or so, so maybe 11. Uh, and, and then in the Nicoya Peninsula and, and in Sardinia and, and, and Loma Linda, it was like 25 to 30% of calories from fat. And then in Icaria, Greece, it was, you know, 35 to 50% of calories from mm, fat. A lot of olive oil. Interesting. And yet, you know, so really broad differences in uh, fat uh, content, the fat and carbohydrate, the, the protein was pretty much 10 to 15% across the board. But in terms of the fat and carbohydrate, there were there were big differences. And to me, it, it what matters most is the source of the macronutrients mm. as opposed to the, you know, uh, percentages of them. And so mm. I think there's wiggle room for people who are eating slightly different dietary patterns. And we want to make everyone feel as though they belong in this community, uh, mm. regardless of whether or not they include, you know, some concentrated fats or oils or, or some salt or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and certainly I tend to be a little more um, hardcore when we're trying to reverse a crisis. Right. Uh, but yeah, but for a healthy athlete, sometimes including a little bit of oil, makes it so much easier for them to meet their caloric requirements. Mm -hmm. And they're burning 5,000 calories a day. It can be really hard to eat that much food. Right. And oil is so concentrating calories, it can, it can make it a bit easier. And so I, I, I don't know, I, I think we are so on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, 100%. And then, of course, if, if you have a little few minutes to touch upon the soy thing, because I'm such a fan of soy, and, to, and I'm, I'm constantly, constantly discussing why soy is such a healthy food, unless you're allergic to it. But could you speak to the benefits of soy products, please? Yeah. So this is probably one of my biggest frustrations, oh. and, you know, it, because, um, you know, the, the, the um, hate against soy and the anti-soy sentiments are, are essentially, you can, you can trace them back to the Weston A. Price Foundation, Mary Ennig and Sally Fallon. And, and they are probably the biggest anti-vegetarian movement in the world. And they'll, they'll go to the extent of saying vegans are the only people that shouldn't be breastfeeding. 
because your breast milk won't be good enough. I mean, they're really anti-vegetarian and, and very pro-meat and milk. And, and the, if you trace back the anti-soy stuff, it, it almost always lands at Mary and Egg and Sally Fallon. And, and so I, I think that, you know, what we need to recognize first is to me the acid test where soy is concerned is to look at the longest lived people on the planet, the places where they have more centenarians than anywhere else in the world. Two out of the fly, five blue zones, soy is a staple. Mm -hmm. If soy was poison, it probably wouldn't be a staple in two out of five of the blue zones, Loma Linda and Okinawa, and they average a couple of servings of soy a day. There may be more um, research on soy than any other single food. There are so many studies, and the studies very consistently show uh, reduced risk of certain types of cancer, uh, reduced recurrence of cancer, uh, better survival, especially with breast cancer, with prostate cancer. Uh, we see uh, reduced risk of heart disease. We see reduced risk of kidney disease. Uh, we see less male pattern baldness. We see better uh, reduced uh, symptoms of menopause in women. Um, soy is a very if we want to say high quality, but a protein that includes a wonderful mix of essential fatty acids, uh, tofu, which is, you know, some of the more popular soy foods like tofu and soy milk are very digestible uh, proteins. Soy is one of the most versatile foods on the planet it, it, because you can use it as a meat substitute. You can use it as a milk substitute. You can use it in baking. You can, you know, you can just use it in so many applications from a culinary perspective. It makes being vegetarian or vegan more enjoyable, more nutritious. Um, and and so I I just it makes me sad when people who are plant based say, oh, soy is dangerous. Uh, uh, the, <laughs> the 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 evidence is absolutely overwhelming in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Now, there, there is some discussion about, you know, um, organic versus, uh, you know, conventionally mm -hmm. grown soy. And I think organic soy, it's not sprayed with glyphosate and it's not genetically modified and so on. And so if those are concerns to you, definitely buy organic. But what I find is that a lot of the soy for people is organic mm -hmm. <laughs> or is at least non-GMO. Mm -hmm. The soy that's grown for animals is the conventional and sprayed like crazy and the animals eat it and then we eat the animals and think it's not a problem. So <laughs> people don't they they look oh my goodness. Because we never look up river and say, like, okay, well what's feeding that, you know, animal exactly. that I'm eating that comes in the plastic cellophane wrap. Absolutely. Oh, yes. So we have hit so many of the really important points that I wanted to discuss today. And I've kept you past the hour you promised me. Oh, so that's, thank you. That's absolutely <laughs> fine. I had such fun doing it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, man. I, I am, it's just, it's just fantastic. And I'm going to make sure and put your books on uh, my, my list I give to patients. And this certainly, I don't know why it took me so long to ask you to get on this podcast. It's Aww. been going on for so like I should have reached out a long time ago. Oh, well, thank you for reaching this out. I'm, I'm delighted to be connected with you because we're so on the same page. <laughs> yes. yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's it's so refreshing to see someone who's been in this field and such a respected um, researcher and you know someone who's actually practiced this with patients and all these amazing things understand what I'm saying because there's so many that aren't they're just so stuck in their dogma and their way of doing things I was like oh. I'm like I'm seeing the patients this is what I'm seeing and everything you're seeing resonates so true and I really appreciate it you have no idea <laughs> oh well thank you so much it was so fun to be with you today uh, well everyone I hope you listen to this and if you have any hateful comments just keep them to yourself but these are this is we're just speaking the truth from experience and research in this very sound scientific background so thank you again Brenda we really so appreciate your 
your investment in your career and just really making things so much more easy for people to understand and just making way for us behind you. <laughs> well, my, uh, my privilege and thank you so much for having me, Laurie.